on Access Tech Live. Making Lego accessible for everyone. How relevant is Braille in 2023? And Grant Hardy is with us. This is Access Tech Live with Stephen Scott and Mark Aflalo. The latest in tech and accessibility every week. Follow us and get involved now at Access Tech Live. Hey everyone, welcome to another Access Tech Live. I am Stephen Scott, Mark Aflalo is by my side as always over there in Montreal. Is it nice and cold like it is here in Glasgow, Scotland, Mark? Min minus eight Celsius, um, but that doesn't stop everybody from hoarding the malls, getting their last minute shopping in before the kids will go on break for a couple of weeks. So uh, it is cold, but it is the holiday season, Mr. Scott. Sure is. Uh, same, of course, around the world. Not so quite so cold here. I feel like I have won in this particular game uh, of the season. Mm -hmm. There we go, our first festive game we've just played. How cold is it where you are? Uh, and uh, it seems as if I won uh, because it's only minus two here. It's amazing. It's just T-shirt weather. That's all it is. T-shirt weather. We don't even need <laughs> shorts. Anything is absolutely fine. Uh, are you all set for the holidays? We're getting close. I, I, I'm pretty good. I think you know uh, we started with Hanukkah and then we go into Christmas. So it's uh, it's good. And my son's birthday is beginning of December, so it's nonstop for us. Oh, come like the wow. end of November until the holidays. Now we're just trying to figure out what we're going to occupy our time with during that break because we're not really outdoorsy types. Okay, well, yeah, that's, well, I, I've got the answer to that. I can help you with this. I mean, okay, I don't have kids, oh, okay. but I, I, I can do. help. Yeah, I've got the answer. So the answer is iPad. Just give the child an iPad, <laughs> fill it with games and lots of credit on those games, and you won't see them for weeks. It'll be perfect. I, I don't know if that's the best idea because that's kind of what they do anyway. But, uh, but we'll okay, try it fine. maybe for a day or two. <laughs> well, you know, look, I tried. Okay, I tried and I'm not trying again. Uh, so this week, let's dive into what's coming up on the show this week. We are going to be diving into a topic, I've got to say, that is very near and dear to my heart. We're talking about Braille and in particular Braille literacy. Uh, Access Tech Live correspondent Grant Hardy is a big Braille user and a huge uh, proponent of Braille as well. He will be joining us. Also, Matthew Schifrin is joining us, a man who helped drive the creation of the first accessible instructions for LEGO. Uh, he will be joining us as well. Uh, but before all of that, of course, we get to the headlines, and Marco Flalo has those. Now, Access Tech Live headlines. So Apple has released iOS 17.2 on Monday, along with versions for, of course, iPadOS, macOS Sonoma, tvOS, and watchOS. Highlights of the new update include the new journaling app, which is integrating data from various Apple apps for journaling suggestions. Other features include a catch-up arrow and messages, spatial video photos that are going to be compatible with Vision Pro down the road, and updates to the weather app. Now, macOS 14.2 Sonoma brings tweaks to messages and weather, plus enhancements to autofill for forms. On the iPhone 15 Pro specifically, updates include action button support for translate and improved telephoto camera focus. Hmm. Looking forward to talking about that a little bit later. The European Union has revealed its first draft of its Artificial Intelligent Act. This is designed to set rules on the use and development of AI. The guidelines include obligations for high-impact AI systems like risk assessment, transparency requirements on anything that handles any kind of personal information. Now, the new act could impose fines on people who actually violate it, which will be based on, of course, the size and, of course, revenue affected by any violations. Certain uses of AI are even banned in the act entirely, including facial recognition and recognition from CCTV cameras. Law enforcement exceptions do exist, but we have yet to determine the entire scope of the act, which is expected to be put into law in 2025, once it's been hopefully thoroughly vetted. Google is working on a feature for its Messages app that would let you edit sent messages. Hmm, catch up time. This new addition was hinted in a beta version of Messages, with code that suggests that the new feature is coming. Now, message editing is already a feature in other apps like Apple's iMessage and even WhatsApp, so it's not clear on how Google's iteration will work, but speculation is it may be compatible with the RCS messaging protocol. We will find out, hopefully, early on in the new year. Facebook's parent company, Meta, is going to be making all personal chats 
and calls on Messenger and Facebook completely private. It's about time. Designed to help keep users safe from hackers, the company will be introducing end-to-end -end encryption across Messenger to ensure that not even they can read the contents of it. Now, most users will embrace this addition. Some governments are kind of worried about it and wondering how it might affect keeping children safe online. Stephen, you know, uh, you know, we always want to keep our kids safe online, but I think end-to-end -end encryption is probably something that's going to benefit everybody across the board, and it's about time that they brought it to the table. Yeah, of course, you mentioned the AI Act as well out of the EU, which is going to be very interesting to see how that furthers itself into regulating AI, which, you know, even people like Elon Musk have been campaigning for and pushing for more AI. I've got to say, though, the big story for me out of Meta this week, in particular around those Ray-Ban glasses that everyone's been raving about, uh, well, they get a new feature this week, and again, everyone's really excited by this because now you can take a photo using those Meta Ray-Ban glasses, and they will uh, give you the information back in spoken form, actually speak back to you uh, the description of what it is you're looking at. Now, of course, here in the blind community, we feel a little bit superior here, right? Because we're thinking, hey, we've had this for a long time. We've got Be My Eyes, yeah, and exactly. Envision Glasses has been out for ages, and they've had this feature as well. Uh, it's just actually this year, in fact, they brought this uh, new AI feature in. But it's good to see these mainstream companies bringing in these features and making them as accessible as they are because the price point is considerably lower for Meta Ray-Ban than, say, Envision Glasses. So something very much uh, to uh, to get into. But, you know, Definitely. really interesting AI story uh, and more AI stories. Like you say as well, iOS 17.2 coming out, lots mm -hmm. of cool features. We're going to delve into that today with Grant, right? But I'm going to talk to Grant a bit. I mean, there's a lot of cool features. The big thing they're talking about is this journaling app. I don't quite get it yet. I, I'm not a big journaling guy, but I know no, that, no. you know, health health studies do show that journaling helps, you know, get, you know, make that connection between yourself and really kind of offload some of that, that negative energy. So maybe I'll start journaling. I don't know. Are you going to do it? No, because I'm just all I'm going to write in the journal is oh great, got another thing I have to do, which is to write about my day. <laughs> oh great, another thing to add on, more negative energy. Uh, but I will say though, for those who have been updating their Mac recently, uh, and especially I'm just saying this from my point of view as a blind voiceover user, that's the free screen reader. I don't know why I call it free because it's a built-in screen reader. Let's <laughs> call it that. That's actually on the Mac. Uh, it has had a bug for a long time which affects a lot of blind users where when you use Safari, the web browser, you get this voiceover message that says Safari not responding and it's basically just the system trying to catch up. No mm. reason for years this has been an issue and no reason given by Apple or a fix ever seemed to be coming. All of a sudden with this new macOS Sonoma update, it's fixed. No idea what was going on, but you know what? Well done, Apple. You got it sorted in the end, so so good news. And, and don't um, forget, Stephen, lots of bug fixes. I mean, this is why they're encouraging people to minutes, update. Yeah. To this, so there's a lot of the over 11 vulnerabilities that are documented, and, and we're hearing that there's close to you know 20, 25 different vulnerabilities that are patched. So it's it's a good thing to do. So if you haven't already updated the 17.2, don't hesitate. Do that across the board because it does keep you safe at the end of the day. Speaking yeah, normally with day, Stephen. Well, yeah, but I was just going to say, you know, on the on this point about updates, normally we're kind of a little bit hesitant to say do the upgrade soon, but actually. This is a good one to do. This does fix a lot of bugs and, and security issues. Okay, let's move on because our question of the day, Mark. Uh, this mm -hmm. is uh, brilliant. So, you know, I, I have to say, as a kid, I loved Lego. Did, were you a Lego fan as a kid? Oh, God, yeah, of course. I mean, who doesn't love Lego? Yeah, I mean, come on, right? And, you know, the, the addition of Braille Bricks recently has just been an incredible story of uh, bringing everyone, frankly, not just blind kids, even blind adults into this. Uh, you know, I was, I was at the Lego store just the other week. I was wanting to buy a box of these Braille Bricks. And... The person at the store said to me, look, we're actually, we don't have any in-store. We can't get enough of them in. Uh, they just sell out so quickly. Uh, so you can get them online, which is great. You get them from lego.com. You just search for Braille bricks and there they are. But here's the thing. Uh, she said, I've just bought some for me and my friend. I said, oh, is your friend blind? She said, no, no, no. She said, we just love the idea. And I love that. I just love that they've made Braille interesting to so many more people. Uh, it's just a great thing. So that that is kind of what's led us to this question of the day uh, or question of the week here on the show, which is what is the most ultimate Lego creation you've ever made? And please, if you're getting in touch via the channels, send pictures and uh, we, we'll show them here on the program.
And here's how you get in touch with us. You can find us on all our social media. It is at Access Tech Live, of course. You can also email those photos to feedback at accesstechlive.com. And don't forget that after today's show, you can still send us those creations. We want to see what you've got your mind going to, especially when it comes to Lego and you guys can get involved. Stephen, coming up, we're going to dive into some more of the headlines with Grant Hardy, familiar voice and face here on AMI-tv. So do stick around. This is Access Tech Live. We'll be right back. We want to hear from you. Follow us on social media and get involved at Access Tech Live. We'll be right back. The latest in tech and accessibility. This is Access Tech Live with Stephen Scott and Marka Flalo. So joining us now on the show is a familiar voice and face uh, to AMI TV audiences. He is a regular on the series Kelly and Ramia and he's worked on several stories for Double Tap TV in the past. Grant Hardy, welcome here to Access Tech Live. Fantastic to be here and I can't wait to talk some tech with you. Oh, okay. that's going to be great, right? So roll up your <laughs> sleeves. Let's dive in. Uh, but before we uh, right. delve into the week's news headlines, <laughs> I, I want to mention quickly, because last week we talked about TransLink, which is Vancouver's transit authority, officially announcing the Braille integration across uh, all of their stops. Now, living in Vancouver yourself, uh, we've got to ask you this. Have you had a chance to check this out? Yeah, I mean, I do take transit quite frequently. And uh, at the end of the day, there's only so close that you can get to a bus stop with your phone, right? You can maybe get a, a few meters away. Plus, of course, it's important to remember some people don't have access to that GPS technology. And just standing at a pole and listening to the bus going past you and thinking, oh, crap, I'm at the wrong spot again, uh, can be really infuriating. And now having this option to know exactly when you're standing at a bus stop by looking at the Braille, just like a sighted person would look at the sign and see you know, what buses are coming to the stop, uh, it's really fantastic. So hats off to them for, for making this really just standard across the board. Yeah, I hope yeah, I hope yeah, other companies in, in other provinces and cities take and learn a lesson from this because this is something that just should be natural across the board, especially with right, people exactly. adding like light rail systems and, and stuff like that. Uh, Grant, when we were kind of preparing for the show, uh, we were talking about some of the things that you were interested uh, for you to talk about specifically this week. One of which was, you know, the meta story about encrypting all the private messages across, obviously, Facebook Messenger and, and WhatsApp. Can you break that down a little bit for people who don't really understand what that means at the end of the day for them? Yeah, I mean, essentially end-to-end -end encryption means that your data can only be accessed between you and your recipient in the case of, of a uh, 
message. But if there's some sort of a data breach in the cloud or someone tried to, you know, social engineer Meta or Apple or whoever it is to get access to your account, or even, yes, in the case of uh, law enforcement trying to get access to that data, they will not physically not be able to do so without knowing your passcode, your password, all your security information needed to log into the account. Because it's not a question of just securing your account, but your data is actually encrypted based upon your login info. So it's physically impossible for someone to access it. Uh, would you so, say that's wait, a fair? What? Yeah. Yeah, no, so, so that's a fair description. I think it, it narrows it down for people who don't really understand what, what mm. that means. I'm curious, you know, your thoughts on the importance of this, because there's a careful balance here that we need to have between obviously protecting our personal information and what we think is private. You know, sometimes, you know, who cares about a chat between myself and my son? But uh, you also have to balance it with the law enforcement side of things because by doing this, yes, we're you know Meta's doing a great service to their customer base, and we feel a little bit more protected. But do we really feel that safe if, for some reason, someone needs to get access to that and they can't? So I think it's really important to acknowledge the fact that we live in a very vulnerable world where people, including law enforcement, don't always behave properly. I mean, we're in a world where, you know, women are concerned about just some random private citizen or the government suing them or arresting them for maybe traveling out of state to have an ab abortion. Uh, you know, there are lots of other issues like that where the laws that we have and the governments that are in power don't necessarily always act in a way that we would consider socially just or appropriate. And there are a lot of these examples where I kind of talk to people and they're like, you know, if I have nothing to hide, you know, wh why would I have to worry? But something like this, you know, people kind of go like, okay, I get it. Like, I kind of get why non-criminals, the, the good guys, quote unquote, uh, would want that end-to-end -end encryption. I also think that it's incredibly clear that we cannot secure our accounts without it. Like, it, it's just impossible. There's so many data breaches. We just had a big data breach with the, the DNA matching website. Uh, many, you know, Apple accounts and other accounts have been stolen through just basic s social engineering, convincing a human who wants to be helpful to help you get into an account that's not yours. So I think that if we don't want privacy to be an antiquated concept, we really do need this end-to-end -end encryption. Also just wanted to mention the fact that law enforcement, like they do have a lot of might on their side. Like you might not be handing them your data on a silver platter, but they're pretty powerful. If they wanted to install something to spy on your router at home, you know, maybe a camera to you know, capture your passcode, whatever they want to do, you may not be handing them your data on a silver platter, but I just don't agree with the concept of like, they're going to go black. Like I feel that they're going to figure out a way to get the data that they need to get. Curious what you guys think. So basically well, I'm, a, I'm a very pro privacy, pro encryption person. Yeah, I, I'm with you on this, Grant, but I think most people aren't. And, you know, and I hear you know, young people <clears> these days, I even hear people my own age who post pictures of their kids regularly on Facebook, and they don't think about, for example, geolocking or geolocating uh, those photographs. So, for example, you know, the, the, the information that's actually in the image itself that gives away the location <clears> that was taken. Uh, you know, people don't realize that. How many friends do you know go off on holiday and take snaps while they're on holiday, basically telling everybody on Facebook or on Instagram or whatever else, oh, we're not here, our house is sitting empty and you can, you know, know right? feel free to, to burgle if you want. You know, that's <laughs> the problem with all of this, right? I don't know, you know, I get what you're saying, but I think, does that really translate to the average person? Do they know about all the settings that need to be uh, fixed and adjusted to make sure that their data is safe? Yeah, I I hear what you're saying, and I think that's that's a good example of what I mean. Is that the the world is just kind of a a privacy nightmare at at the moment, and I think that some younger people e either don't care or like literally think that privacy is just an antiquated concept, especially yeah. because of all the data breaches that are happening. But I just, I don't agree. Like, I think things should be built in a way where you don't even have to worry about the settings. You know, it, it's just like the data security on your phone. It just sort of works. You, you don't even have to, to know how it's secured. But, you know, behind the scenes, there's some, some very powerful 
forces at, at play. But I, I, I agree in the sense that I honestly feel like we might lose this fight because not a lot of people, not enough people really care or understand the, the consequences of winning or losing this fight. I don't know. Yeah, I think there's a whole show and a whole, you know, conversation to be had about just the basic things you can do to secure devices, not only for yourself, but for family members around there. I want to touch briefly on the iOS 17.2 update because a lot of people ask me, oh, should I do this? Is it important? And when they come to me, I always say, listen, it, this is not going to mess up software. This is one of these things that really is there to, yeah, bring new features to the table, but also secure your device and secure vulnerabilities. Do you jump on updates when they first come out? <laughs> Absolutely. If I haven't installed them uh, in advance during the, the beta cycle, or at least the, the release candidate, I, I absolutely jump on it right away. Um, I, I am someone who, uh, whenever I look back on the journals that I've made throughout the years, it's just such a wonderful way to reflect on my life. So I, I've immediately started using the journal app. Uh, I'm, I'm kind of someone who tends to jump on all of the features. And as you said, there, there's some really great features, especially now some, some better protections uh, for knowing if your iMessages are, are intercepted and a lot of other security things like that. So yes, absolutely, I jump on updates pretty much immediately if there are no show-stopping bugs that I've heard about. Okay, Grant, stick around. Uh, we're going to take a quick break and come back with Matthew Schifrin and then bring you back and talk a little bit about Braille. Obviously, the conversation about Braille starts with, of course, um, uh, this gentleman who's going to be joining us after the quick break. He found a way to make Lego accessible for himself and for others. And then guess what? Lego actually took notice and took it to a whole new level. So let's take a quick break and come back with Matthew Schifrin. And of course, Grant, stick around. We're going to come back to you a bit later. We want to hear from you. Follow us on social media and get involved at Access Tech Live. We'll be right back. in tech and accessibility. This is Access Tech Live with Stephen Scott and Mark Aflalo. Hi, I'm Stephen Scott. Mark Aflalo is with me as always. Our next guest is a Lego enthusiast who found that putting together the famous colored bricks wasn't quite easy when you are blind or indeed low vision. So he set out to change that. Matthew Schifrin is the creator of Bricks for the Blind and joins us now. Welcome to the show, Matthew. Oh, thank you so much. Great to be here, Stephen. So how long have you been building Lego before you founded Bricks for the Blind? And, and tell us more about what that's all about. Oh, so my Lego journey started in the middle of a stranger's driveway when I was six or seven. And my friend Elila was driving me back from a piano lesson. We stop 
somewhere. She says, get out of the car. I do, but I say, you know, this isn't our house. Where are we? And she said, walk forward. I have a surprise for you. So I make my way forward and hit a big plastic crate. And I say, what's this? She says, doesn't matter. We have to get it in the car. The two of us are able to haul this plastic crate into the trunk of her car. And she says, open this. So I open this crate, and it's filled to the brim with Lego bricks. And that was really when my journey with Lego started. And it continued on through my days in elementary school. And in elementary school, it was very interesting because all my friends were big Lego fans. And they would build the latest castles and dinosaurs and pirate ships and robots. And they would tell me, oh, I built a pirate ship. And I'd say, that's amazing. How'd you do it? And they'd look at me and they'd say, well, you know, we, the instructions, they had the pictures, they told us what to do. And so we just followed them. And I really didn't have that opportunity. So I'd commandeer my parents. And I'd say, mom, dad, do you have any free time? And they'd say, well, not really, but what do you need? And I'd say, could we please build the set? And we'd start building. And it took us hours. It took us three, four hours to make a $20, $30 set because uh, they had to tell me what piece we needed. I'd go scrounging around for it in the box. And then they'd tell me where to put it. And I'd put it somewhere. And then we'd go piece by piece. And it was excruciating. And the parents were suffering because it took so much time. And as a result, a lot of... <laughs> A lot of the sets just ended up in the general Lego bin, swallowed up, never to be built again. And that all changed on my 13th birthday. Elila, the same friend who I'd mentioned before, uh, came over and she brought this box and this binder. And this box is big. It's not a shoebox. It's something serious. And I shake the box and it makes that tinkly plastic sound. So I have an idea of what's there. But then I realized that this box has a label, a label in Braille. And the Braille label says, Lego Battle of Alamut. And that's a large Middle Eastern castle that I had secretly been eyeing on Amazon. And because I couldn't build sets, I would read reviews and I would drool over the possibility. These sighted people would write about the glories and they'd say, oh, well, this one has a camel, that one has a dragon. And I'd always think, wow, you know, they're really, they're having the time of their lives here. But then Zilda said, open this binder. And in this binder were hand-brailed instructions that she had created on her own. And they said exactly what kind of pieces you needed and where they should be placed. And that was really when, when my life changed. Because that was the first time that I was able to build a set on my own. And she'd done an amazing job with the sorting of the pieces. She had taken each step of the instructions. And she had put the parts for that stuff into a separate Ziploc bag, and she labeled that in Braille. And so when I needed the uh, pieces for the next step, I'd just take the next Ziploc. You're done with step one, take Ziploc two. And it was a very fast and very efficient process. And it was really just amazing. A lot of people, when they get into a hobby, uh, Lego or puzzle building or chess, whatever it may be, they talk about entering the flow state. And in this flow state, all you're thinking about is this current moment and this current experience, whatever puzzle piece you're looking for, whatever Lego brick you're placing, whatever move you're considering in your chess game, that is all that you can think about. And that flow state was crucial to me as a blind person because oftentimes blind people are very easily stressed by the world around them. They walk around, they need to get from point A to point B. Is this the right door? Is that the right train? What side of the street am I on? Et cetera, et cetera. So navigating a city is very stressful. And what Lego offered me was the opportunity to really relax and just focus on this one thing. But not only that, Lego was a wonderful opportunity to learn about the world around me. I couldn't climb the Louvre, the Statue of Liberty, or the Millennium Falcon from Star Wars. The Louvre would get me arrested, and the Millennium Falcon just doesn't exist. And Lego <laughs> allowed for this experience of these landmarks and these moments of cinema and all this stuff. And as soon, it was really an opportunity to just engage with the world in a way that had previously been impossible. As soon we, as we built that first set, I said, okay, we need to step this up a notch. Those first instructions had been just in paper braille. And so then we started writing instructions as Microsoft Word documents. I could read them on a braille note taker and Lilo could braille them on a computer. And so then we realized that this was the way to do it. I could braille them, uh, she could braille them, I could... She types them, I correct them. And then we had this stash of instructions and I thought we need to start a website. So initially we started this website called Lego for the Blind. 
And then Nina died of cancer. And I thought to myself, okay, you have a choice. You either keep this project alive and get it into the hands of people who want these experiences, or you just let it crumble. Well, what's your choice? And I said, okay, I want to keep it alive. So I got in touch with Lego, and Lego said, yes, this is wonderful. Uh, we want to make instructions. So then Lego started making their own instructions for some of their sets. And Lego for the Blind evolved and turned into Bricks for the Blind. And Bricks for the Blind create text-based building instructions for Lego sets. And we do the sets that Lego do not adapt. And we basically, we try to cover as many different themes and kind of uh, types of set as possible. So recently we have instructions up for the Saturn V rocket, which has 1,959 pieces. And you build the rocket and it's big and glorious and you have little astronauts and you can put them on the rocket. And it's this whole experience. And what's cool uh, in terms of Bricks for the Blind's evolution is initially when we had Lego for the Blind, it was just me testing the instructions. And Nina was our only writer. And now we have sighted instruction writers and a group of blind instruction testers. And the writers write the instructions. They have the set. They take the pictorial instructions and then they... Uh, write out in text. Put a one by two brick vertically on the front left corner of the four by two plate. A plate is a flat Lego piece and a brick is a brick Lego piece. Uh, but now these blind testers, what they do is they give the feedback. They get instructions from the sighted person. And now it's their job to build the set and to figure out whether there are any mistakes or if things are confusing, how they can explain them further. And the best part is really seeing these blind testers, they're having as much fun as I have. And it's just wonderful seeing both the blind and the sighted communities engaged in this project and really reveling in the opportunity to make it accessible. But the best part are the fans. As soon as a new set comes out, we get emails from blind Lego fans and they say, wow, I never thought I could do this, but here I am. You guys got me into this hobby that I never thought that I could get into. And that's the joy of it. You know, Matthew, um, you've turned this into almost a full-time career. You've spoken at numerous high-profile events, venues, TED Talks. I'm curious how that came to be, and I'm curious um, also because since then, Legos launched their own Braille Bricks, which we've talked about a lot on the show here. Have you had a chance to play with those? Oh, the Braille Bricks are absolutely wonderful, and they are a great opportunity to really, uh, in the blind landscape, as you know, there's a lot of talk about literacy and People aren't learning Braille as much as they should. How do they do this? And Braille bricks are an absolutely fantastic way to really turn Braille into play. And you can play, instead of Pictionary, you could play Constructionary, where you have a bunch of bricks and someone picks a brick and they say, hey, it's got to start with D. And so the kid can build a dog or a dinosaur or a dump truck or whatever. And uh, it's just the sheer amount of possibilities that Braille bricks offer for literacy but also they make it fun d can be for a darth vader you can put him on your d c can be for i don't know the cyclone you build a tornado whatever the freedom that they offer is really unparalleled uh in terms of the ted talks and the speaking that came about because <clears throat> of a documentary called how lego helps blind people see there's a, a youtube channel called braincraft who do neuroscience videos and when Lego for the Blind was first starting, uh, Bricks for the Blind, I should say, I thought to myself, okay, you have to get this out there beyond the people who you know. How do you do that? And I went on YouTube, and I found all of the YouTube creators who create science and educational content, kind of pop science, if you will. And I wrote all of them, and emails and links and this and that, and BrainCraft were the ones who responded. And Vanessa Hill, the creator of the BrainCraft channel, she's a neuroscientist, psychologist, she made an absolutely incredible video. And in this video, it wasn't just the accessible instructions. It was really an analysis of how a blind person's brain is able to process this type of information differently than a sighted person's. And that video did so well that that's really when everything else kind of took off. After that were the TED Talks and the articles in the Washington Post and all of these other things really sprung out of that video. And before that video, there was also a wonderful article in Popular Science that really kind of catapulted things. Those two articles were the things that really got us started. 
Matthew, I just, want to, I just want to ask you this because, you know, it's interesting you talk about getting the word out to more people. And, you know, my recent experience of going to the Lego store, and I'm blind myself, going to buy the Braille bricks, being told you can get them online, which is great, and I was happy to do that. But then being confronted by a staff member who tells me that they've bought a, a set of these Braille bricks for her sighted friend, she is sighted herself, it, it kind of shows how this, this whole idea has kind of transcended the whole need to make Lego more accessible, especially to children, which was the original purpose of Lego Braille Bricks, and now, of course, to adults through play as well. It's kind of even eating into everybody else's interest of Braille, which is surely brilliant. Absolutely. It's just Matthew, amazing it's been great to having see you. Yeah, I mean, it's oh, been sorry. great having no, you. No. You've, got, you've got an incredible story that you've been sharing with us today. I, I, I honestly... I am furiously taking notes in my mind of all these websites I have to go and visit immediately afterwards because when I get my Braille bricks through, uh, I need to go and check out all these uh, audio instructions and everything else. I, I think there's a lot of people who are going to be learning a lot from this today. Um, you know, Mark, I don't know about you, but you know, I, I didn't really know much about this, this side of things at all. I knew that Lego Braille bricks was a thing. I'm learning so much today, which is why I love doing this programme. Uh, Matthew Schifrin, thank you so much for coming on to double uh, to Access Tech Live <laughs> and uh, joining us here. Uh, you just, uh, I'm always plugging my other show, Matthew, just ignore me. Um, but yes, uh, you can find uh, Matthew and everything he does at bricksfortheblind.com. That's bricksfortheblind.com, where org. I will be heading straight after. Or .org, he said? Okay, perfect. We'll, we'll, it's we'll put that up, it's Matthew. Not .com. <laughs> It's not .com, it's .org. There we go. I'll, I'll absolutely clarify that. Bricks for the blind .org. Matthew, thank you. When we come back, guys, uh, the CNAB helps uh, get the word out about you know, Lego Braille and Bricks. Grant Hardy's back to discuss, obviously, that and a lot more. Plus, of course, your answers to the question of the day and hopefully some photos. So uh, do stick around. This is Access Tech Live. We'll be back with Grant in just a moment. We want to hear from you. Follow us on social media and get involved at Access Tech Live. We'll be right back. in tech and accessibility. This is Access Tech Live with Stephen Scott and Mark Aflalo. January is Braille Literacy Awareness Month, so we're getting ahead of things here at Access Tech Live. Grant Hardy is back with us. Uh, Grant, Mark, before we uh, dive back into things, I just want to drop this clip in here because uh, I spoke recently to CNIB's Andrea Voss uh, to talk about uh, basically how CNIB uh, has been partnering with Lego to distribute Braille Bricks. CNIB and Lego, we partnered in 2020 
to help distribute the Lego Braille Brick kits, the first philanthropic effort, the distribution of these kits to vision itinerant teachers across the country. Um, now, we've been successful doing so, and we've had a lot of people who maybe were not the desired um, user or intended user group for the Braille kits, because this is really for practitioners and for teachers who are responsible for teaching Braille to children. Um, and because of the response, um, overwhelming response from people who were not teachers, maybe these were family members or people who had a neighbor or a friend who also wanted to access Lego Braille bricks. Um, the Lego group now has a retail version that is available and it's available on their lego.com website for anyone who is interested in Braille and learning Braille in a fun way, inclusive way, um, those are accessible to all now. That is the CNIB's Andrea Voss. Now, Grant, uh, have you had any hands-on experience with these uh, Lego Braille bricks that uh, I have to say, I, I can't wait to get my hands on? Yeah, I have touched, uh, I have had the opportunity to touch them at least. Uh, really fantastic that they're now able uh, able to be purchased beyond schools and blindness organizations. I think that disabilities can be such a scary thing for people, especially a low incidence group like bl uh, blindness, unfortunately. But something like Braille, people just think is so cool that it's a nice little entry into the world of like acceptance and inclusion. So fantastic. Guys, I got to ask you both a question here, and correct me if I'm wrong, but when it comes to actually learning Braille, um, is this something that's actually being done actively when it comes to kids? I know, Stephen, you're taking Braille classes now. You're doing stuff at later in your in your life because it wasn't available to you when you were younger. Are we seeing a resurgence of Braille? Uh, well, Braille I, is... I would say we are. Yeah. Well, okay, Grant, you're the guest here. You go first, then I'll, I'll throw oh, in I'm my so thoughts sorry. at the end. <laughs> no, I, I think absolutely Braille is is taught in schools, especially for people who were born with vision loss. A little bit trickier if you leave, lose your vision in later life, but I, I think Braille is pretty much an essential skill, unless your parent is really firm, I don't want this kid learning Braille or something. But I, otherwise, I don't think it's, you know, I don't think it's gone away or anything like that. Stephen, go ahead. Yeah, well, it's funny you say that because I think the parenting part is actually a really important part of the discussion we don't often have because the parents are making the decisions for us as children, right? Which is right and proper. But, you know, I do think there is more of a need and I, maybe it's different in Canada, but certainly here in the UK for a long time, it, it has never been the case that children who are low vision, so who have some usable vision, were encouraged to learn Braille. What actually happened was they were encouraged to learn technology, which is good. And of course, we should encourage all children to know all about the latest technology. That's really important. But Braille is an essential skill, as you would agree, I'm sure, Grant, that you know it's a, such an essential skill. Not just, I mean, literacy, of course, is the key, but that leads to uh, greater skills in education, greater ability to do more in education, and of course, give you the chance to do more and get a, a better job, get employed. Well, absolutely. Braille, Braille is so heavily uh, correlated with employment if you're blind. Plus, you have all these jobs that are now requiring uh, STEM, you know, science, technology, math, uh, which I would argue would be incredibly difficult, not impossible to do with, with just speech, but Braille really adds an, an element of literacy, as you said, convenience, uh, efficiency to your life. There are lots of tech options for Braille too. Like it doesn't have to be low tech or anything, uh, but absolutely. Like if someone is has the prospect of being blind or very low vision, uh, I would say, it's an essential skill to learn. Grant, I was, you know, you know, full disclosure here, about a year ago, you did a segment for Double Tap TV, and I was super jealous because I was on the line with you, and, you know, you're facing the camera, you're doing what you're supposed to be doing, but you have the added bonus of being able to use your brailler to read your script. So, you know, unlike me, who has to put a prompter up and figure out how I can make it look like I'm looking at a camera the entire time and focus on that and make sure that things are scrolling, you got all that fun stuff in front of you. It got me, it got me really jealous. Uh, I, I'm curious... How long have you been reading Braille? Did you learn it at a young age? I learned it as a very young kid, basically from, you know, 
kindergarten on. I, I was learning Braille as other people were learning print. Uh, and it's uh, to say that it's an advantage in my life would be an understatement. I, I don't know where I would be without knowing Braille, especially like even in my job, moving into a uh, very fast paced, uh, you know, lo- live shows, Braille has been very helpful for me. Uh, not everybody knows Braille though, and they still do not only fine, but they do an ex- exceptional job. So I certainly do not want to under and undersell what you can do without braille that's not what i'm saying at all uh but it's definitely a huge advantage i I, just the tech side telling kids i used to tell kids like i'm a guy that can read once they turn off the lights i can read in the dark (laughs) and that used to make kids very very jealous uh yeah it's it's a it's a neat thing to have uh in my back pocket you know, jumping back to the Braille bricks, you know, I could see this as such a cool way for, um, you know, imagine just, you know, bridging a family, you know, just, you know, if you have people who are using Braille and people are not using Braille, being able to do something together um, that they would not necessarily have been able to do before is really, really cool being able to, you know, have that tactile, that feel to the bricks themselves. I, I just, it, it, it blows my mind, guys. I know, right? A- absolutely. It's just all about that inclusion, making disability less scary like more normalized uh you know having braille in as as many spots as possible so that the blind person can benefit from it but also the public can uh like witness it and it just seems more quote unquote normal that's that's always the goal yeah and i think that's that's the key isn't it for children especially and as i mentioned earlier with matthews is kind of how the whole lego braille bricks got started it was about educating children who are blind to to learn braille which of course is brilliant uh but for adults as well uh, you know we're not all doomed if we don't know braille at exactly. a young age right and actually this is the thing what i love in the last year is there seems to be a, a, have been a change in the conversation about how we use braille so there's no expectation i don't think for anyone including me at the age of 42 now to be sitting here being able to sit down on a Sunday evening and read War and Peace, as great as that <laughs> would be, you know, that's unlikely to happen because the amount of time it would take me to read that book, aside the length of the book itself, wouldn't really be worth my time. But there are things we can do, right? We can use it for labelling, we can use it for quick notes like you were saying, you know, just having access to information in front of you at your fingertips. That's where Braille can be useful to someone at an older age. I know exactly. And being able even to just start from a place of like, okay, you, this might not even, you might not even know what the Braille means, but having a way to distinguish, to, to mark, to label something in a way that just feels kind of different from one label to the next, that's a great start. Or something, something like a tactile watch. Like people think that tactile watches are for people who know, know Braille, uh, but they're really not they can benefit everybody and it gives you a way if you're wishing a bad date or meeting away or whatever you can check the time <laughs> in a to- totally uh discreet <laughs> discreet way by looking at your tactile watch um so just all kinds of great things to to get started e- even if you don't want to in- or, or are not able to integrate braille more into your life or you don't think it's beneficial Lots yeah, of you say that. The, amount, the, the amount of times we've all sat in meetings, in person meetings, <laughs> and we've all wanted to know the time, but don't want to ask or don't want to look down. Uh, I want to ask you a bit quickly around technology, because technology, of course, has, has enabled, I think, Braille to survive in a way that perhaps it may not have done had it not been able to become Braille displays you know, and get itself into that technology. Also now, for example, we see devices like the Hable One, the Orbit Writer coming out that are essentially small Braille-style keyboards that you can interact with your, your iPhone or your computer with. Um, you know, is technology saving Braille? Yes, I, I would say 100%. I can't even remember the last time I read on paper, like Braille paper, uh, it's all about the technology. It's the Braille displays, the Braille note takers. I mean, the thing about them is there's still so much out of the reach for a lot of people because they're so expensive. They get outdated very quickly in terms of software and, and development and, and things like that. Uh, but absolutely i think that it's bringing braille like into the 21st century and and aside from the cost and the pain and getting something uh it really adds a lot of accessibility uh, to interacting with technology and braille 
Well, Jens, you know, we're going to be talking to a bunch of companies at CES in just under a month's time. And that tends to be when we find out about what, what the future holds when it comes to technology, including some of these Braille devices that you guys uh, both use. Uh, Grant Hardy, thank you so much for taking the time to join us. We cannot wait to have you back on in the new year. Um, enjoy the holidays, and we will uh, definitely speak to you soon. Fantastic. Thank you. Coming up on Access Tech Live, your answers to our question of the day. What is the most ultimate Lego creation you have ever made? And we've got some photos. Do stick around. It is Access Tech Live. We want to hear from you. Follow us on social media and get involved at Access Tech Live. We'll be right back. in tech and accessibility. This is Access Tech Live with Stephen Scott and Mark Aflalo. I am Stephen Scott, he is Mark Aflalo, and our question of the day, what is the most ultimate Lego creation you have ever made? And we've asked for pictures as well. Mark, have we been swamped with images and stories? Because this, this is such a cool question. Well, we, we've, we've definitely got a good set of uh, set of uh, pictures here that we're going to talk about. And we're going to start with Evan Ten, who writes, I put this white Porsche 911 RSR together when I was six or seven. It's made up of almost 1,600 pieces. I was so proud of myself. And we're going to put the picture up on the screen now. And you see him obviously holding the actual, not holding, but sitting in front of the, the like I said. I, I love the cars. I love the automotive stuff that Porsche does because the attention to detail is insane, Stephen. I remember putting together this Austin Martin uh, 007 car, and it had things like the license plate would flip when you wanted to. It had cannons out of the front wow. headlights, an ejection seat. Like the, the attention to detail that Lego puts into it blows my mind. So what what's the size of what kind of size is this car? Is it like the Porsche? I mean, I mean it's about the size of a, a, a laptop. To be perfectly honest, it's a, oh, a wow. pretty big invention. Yeah, when you look at it, when you look at the picture here on the screen now, um, next to Evan, it's almost half the size of him, uh, six, seven, or eight year old. <laughs> wow. So they're pretty big. Like this is if if you're going to dive into this hobby, you definitely need somewhere to showcase this stuff because you don't want to just destroy it afterwards. I know a lot of people do, but um, the uh, next one's um, kind of interesting. It's it's Tony Stark's mansion, 5,500 oh. pieces, approximately, writes Abby, and he sends a picture into this mansion. Now, Tony Stark and Iron Man has this, like, two-floor mansion. This is, like, three stories high. There's an Iron Man in the middle on this, like, this like platform on the bottom. Um, you've got characters across the board. There's a bedroom. There's all the different Iron Man around the room in his, like, his workshop in the basement. There's a stairwell off to the right. 
this has got to be, I mean, you want to talk about the car being large in terms of size. This has got to be the size of, I, I mean, uh, this is like a, a giant pot in the kitchen, if not with like stacked on top of each other. They're really, really, really kind of cool. Um, Becky sent us, our good friend Becky Czar, her son Bennett made himself, uh, when he was five, he was a Lego wizard when he was little, she says. And she sends us this picture of him holding this. It looks like a rocket ship, almost like a one of the space shuttles, but it's like black and red. And I don't recall that being an actual Lego, like when you buy it and actually put the puzzle together. I think it's something he created by himself. And he looks so cute there holding it and so proud. And this is what's kind of fun about Lego, especially when you have kids, Stephen. And this, by the way, I mean, kids of all ages. Um, you know, my 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 brother's having surgery in a couple of weeks and he was walking around the mall and he said all he wanted was, was Lego. So, you know, hopefully he's not watching. So he doesn't know that my kids are out there looking for something for him to put together while he's while wow. he's recovering, which is which is kind of fun. Uh, this is a fun one from Will. He writes, our boss was obsessed with Lego, so he made our boardroom table out of Lego. This is so cool. The picture is literally hundreds, if not thousands, of Lego pieces stacked and put on the side with the company logo in the middle, which is a ferret on a green background. And it's a full boardroom table that easily sits about 16 to 18 people. And I know that they covered it with this glass sheet. I remember when they moved their office, they almost needed a specialized mover to come in there and help them move it because it, it was just absolutely insane. And this, by the way, is the first generation. They've made a second table since in their new office because they just couldn't move it, which is absolutely insane. So when it comes to Lego, like it, it is one of these things that transcends generations, whether you're young or you're old. I mean, whether it comes to all the franchises that have hopped on board with Disney, and Marvel and no matter what you think of there's a Lego creation about it and just even when you walk in as you know Stephen you walk into the Lego store the amount of stuff you see on display is absolutely insane the Disney castle the flowers the it's just nuts but when I was a kid it was just a box full of Lego that was all I ever got just a box of bits <laughs> that I put together when did this all start when did it become this huge thing I... you buy specifics and things I mean, you know, it's changed so much, but it's brilliant. I mean, I only ever made anything that was rectangle or square because I couldn't figure out how to do anything else. So it was either a church, which could also become a, just a big rectangular building, or a bus because it was rectangle. That was all I could really build. Uh, I think things have improved. Yeah, things have definitely improved, and I know exactly <laughs> what to get you for the holidays now. We're going to give you some Matthew Schiffer instructions. You're going to go build yep. the Lego set of your absolute oh. dreams and have I'm a ball this whole day. season. <laughs> Guys, thank you so much for being with us this week. And of course, every week, next week, we're going to be looking back at the year in tech. Of course, this week, thank you to Grant Hardy and Matthew Schifrin. On behalf of Stephen Scott, I am Marco Flalo. This has been Access Tech Live. See you next week. Thanks for tuning in to Access Tech Live. Follow us online at all social media at Access Tech Live. Email us feedback at accesstechlive.com. Hosted by Stephen Scott in Glasgow and Mark Aflalo in Montreal. Written by Stephen Scott and Mark Aflalo. Live show director, Dan Benamato. Technical director, Caitlin Robinson. Audio, Jordan Mulgrave. Live graphics and playback, Kingsley Juco. Graphics coordinator, Eliza Rocco. Integrated described video specialist, M. Williams. Production apprentice, Madison Marier. Supervising producer, Michelle Dudas. Copyright 2023, Accessible Media Inc. An AMI original production.